And that concludes general questions. And we now move to questions to the First Minister. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Well, uh, later today I'll be meeting the Managing Director of Microsoft UK uh, to discuss their plans in terms of their apprenticeship programme. Uh, as the Chamber will know, this week we've had uh, some fantastic uh, analysis showing that in the greatly expanded modern apprenticeships uh, programme, 92 per cent uh, of these youngsters are in work six months after completing their modern apprenticeship. Uh, that has uh, stimulated a great deal of interest among companies and the commitment that Microsoft UK will make today is that in the run-up to 2016, uh, they and their partners and suppliers and stakeholders will guarantee a minimum of 2016 new, young, modern apprenticeships. Joanne Lamont. We must obviously welcome any opportunities for our young people. We would only hope that the government had more of a focus on the issues of youth unemployment and the yeah. challenges they face. Because, of course, some of the figures about uh, young people still being in jobs in the, after an apprenticeship is because they were in them before they got the apprenticeship too. The process of the referendum is almost agreed, bar the date. Now we can get down to the substance of the debate. But how will the First Minister conduct that debate? The people of Scotland have made it clear they want clear, honest information. When we have said that an independent Scotland would have to apply to join the European Union and that those negotiations could take time, we have been accused by the First Minister of scaremongering. When the Irish European Affairs Minister yep. says that an independent Scotland would have to apply to the EU and that the negotiations could be lengthy and complex, what is she guilty of? First Minister. I, uh, I'm glad that uh, <clears throat> there's so much agreement now uh, on the processes of, of the <laughs> referendum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm glad that uh, Joanne Lamont and I can, can go forward uh, uh, on that basis, and I look forward to the, the debate. Uh, I really do recommend that uh, Joanne Lamont reads the, uh, uh, the information from the, the Irish European uh, Minister. Uh, what she said, of course, uh, looking at the SNP timetable for negotiating our position from within the European Union, from a yes vote in the referendum to the independence election in 2016, uh, she regarded that position as entirely satisfactory. Uh, that is, seems to me, from uh, a country which, remember, has presidency of the European Council uh, at the moment, uh, a strong endorsement of the SNP uh, position. Uh, uh, I've got to say, Joanne Lawrence, she asked how will we conduct a debate in Scotland. We'll conduct our debate for an independent Scotland in a positive manner. Yeah. I wonder if the Bitter Together campaign of Labour and the Tories can match that commitment. I'm not sure how positive it is to misrepresent what people say when they raise... When they raise legitimate concerns and express a view on what the Scottish Government claims to be the case. Because the Irish European Minister's comments fall well short of Nicola Sturgeon's definitive claim that Scotland's membership yes, of the EU would be, yes. and I quote, automatic. In her clarification, yes. Lucinda Creighton says, Here we go. I think it is clear a newly independent state would have to negotiate terms of membership. She adds these terms, and I quote, would undoubtedly be somewhat different to the existing terms. What part of that does the First Minister disagree with? First Minister. Ministers, a year ago we've always said there'd be negotiations. The crucial point is these negotiations will take part, place from within the European Union. I have here the, the comments of the Minister Crichton in terms of the European Affairs Minister. She says the SNP position between 2014 to 2016, negotiating our position within the European Union sums up the position well. <laughs> That's her exact quote. <laughs> now, I don't know the terminology that Joanne Lamont uses, but it does seem to me uh, that that is something of an endorsement of the position that the SNP has been putting forward. 
Uh, and I have to say to Joanne Lamont uh, that she'll have to catch up with how the terms of the European debate have <laughs> yeah, now changed her unionist partners <laughs> in the Better Together campaign want negotiations to take the UK perhaps out of the European Union altogether. Yes. Is it not entirely possible that negotiating for Scotland and Scotland's interests from within the European Union, wanting to stay part of the European Union, will be rather more successful than an in-out referendum as postulated by her allies in the Conservative Party? You would think to listen to the First Minister that Nicola Sturgeon had never said that our membership of the EU would be, and I quote, automatic. <laughs> the problem with the First Minister, he lives in a world where we're never supposed to remember what he said yesterday, and we're never supposed to expect that tomorrow matches what he says today. The people deserve better. And if the independence debate is to be conducted in what he describes as positive terms, heaven help us all. Because when the BBC reported Lucinda Creighton's comments, they were accused by the SNP of misconstruing what she said. Scandalously, one of their members suggested that the report had been heavily spliced. Yet, what she said and what was reported is backed by the comments of the President of the European Commission, Jose Manuel Barroso, the Czech Foreign Minister, the Spanish Europe Minister and anyone who understands the European Union. What was it that was misconstrued and provoked such a hysterical response from the SNP? Why couldn't they just admit the truth? Minister. Uh, I, uh, can I ask Joanne Lamont to cast her mind back to First Minister's questions of a year ago? Uh, Patricia Ferguson uh, congratulated the government in publishing a consultation document uh, which said that there would be negotiations with the European Union. I replied, I, I say it has never been our position that there would not be negotiations. The point is negotiations would be held from within the context of the European Union. Now, I, I know that maybe it takes a year to, to clarify the position between, <laughs> between, between Patricia Ferguson <laughs> between Patricia Ferguson and Joanne Lamont, but then perhaps if she sorts out an internal communications within the Labour Party, <laughs> that'll be easier uh, to challenge. Now, uh, she gets very upset about uh, any suggestion that uh, the, the BBC it might be uh, misconstruing uh, remarks of, of the Irish Foreign Minister. Can I quote exactly from the Irish Foreign Minister? I am concerned an interview which I conducted with the BBC is being misconstrued. <laughs> And then goes on to endorse the SNP position in the way that I've just outlined. Uh, but, of course, I think in fairness to the BBC, it should be said that she says the BBC position is being misconstrued. And when it comes to finding misconstruers in Scottish society, then the best place to look is the Better Together campaign of Labour and the Conservatives. Thank you. John Lamont. This is the man who went to court to cover up the fact that he didn't have legal advice and has never ever been able to explain what he understands by the terms, terms of the debate. We don't need a lecture from the First Minister about clarity. What we need from him is a degree of honesty because everyone has agreed that the people of Scotland have the right to the best, most accurate information in the run-up to the referendum. But how can they have faith? I know you're doing your job, which is to make a racket. It would suit you better. <laughs> because that's the only internal communication the First Minister requires from you. <laughs> but how can the people of Scotland have faith in the information supplied by the Scottish Government when they so often, remember, have been forced to admit they are wrong, and when those giving accurate facts are ridiculed, bombarded with complaints, and pilloried by the cybernats. What does it say? What does it say about Scotland when the minister of a foreign country is bombarded with abuse for telling the truth, and news organisations 
news organisations from the Scotsman to the Herald to the BBC are traduced for reporting facts that turn out to be true. People, people want information so they can make a judgment on what an independent Order. Scotland would look like. So far, isn't it the case that all we know is that it will be a land where you're not allowed to disagree with Alex Salmond? First Minister. I, 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 I know that uh, Joanne Labont wouldn't want to descend into the language used by some of her colleagues in the House of Commons uh, a couple of weeks ago, but she actually questioned the democratic credentials of this proportional parliament, uh, upholding the legitimacy of the House of Commons as a model of uh, modern, uh, of modern uh, democracy. Uh, I've quoted exactly from uh, Irish Minister Linda Crichton. It was she who said she thought the BBC coverage of her remarks was being misconstrued. Uh, I think that's a very reasonable thing for the Irish uh, European Minister to say, and I think it's really important uh, that uh, she said she found that the SNP position was entirely sensible uh, and endorsed it. Hopefully that sort of confidence in Scotland's European future uh, will translate itself uh, to the uh, Unionist parties uh, in this Parliament, who cannot really seriously believe or doubt uh, that energy-rich, oil-rich, renewable-rich, fishing-rich Scotland would be anything other than, as the Irish Minister indicated, welcome in the ranks of the European <laughs> Union. <laughs> but I was intrigued by the uh, re reference to, to cyberspace because I've been looking at a bit of cyberspace uh, uh, myself. Uh, the Facebook site Labour for Scotland has been tweeted all over the place and I was particularly interested in the comments uh, of Robert McNeil, who's chair of East Lothian CLP and a Better Together coordinator. The Labour Party in Scotland, in my opinion, this is a Labour Party member, have a long way to go before we once again become a party which is electable to the Scottish people. However, until the party recognise what the problems are, then I'm afraid it will take much longer. That's one of our own constituency chairman, a coordinator of the Better Together campaign. I think Joanne Lambert better get a grip of him. He's probably listening to the Tories he's campaigning with in East Lothian. Thank you. Question two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. Uh, no plans in the future. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Now the Electoral Commission report has been widely accepted by all sides of this chamber. We know the spending limits uh, and the question for the referendum, but as mentioned, there is a piece of the jigsaw missing. So can the First Minister tell the people of Scotland what is the exact date on which the referendum will take place? Well, that uh, will be uh, introduced to Parliament with the, the bill which comes into Parliament uh, in March, and I'm sure that that's what Ruth Davidson would fully expect to happen. Ruth um, Davidson? amazed by the First Minister's coy reticence, particularly since he's no stranger to making grandstanding announcements in this chamber at First Minister's questions. So why is he trying to keep his poker hand hidden from the room? And if the referendum is the property of the people of Scotland, why can't he be straight with them? Why are members of his government briefing national newspapers a year ago? We have known for more than a year the date of the 2014 Ryder Cup at Glen Eagles. We have known for more than five years the dates of the Glasgow Commonwealth Games. And important though they are, they don't impact on the course of history of this nation in the same way as a referendum. So the people do deserve to know the Order. date now. Why won't he tell them? Ruth Davidson has just said she knows the date and it for a year. If she knows the debate, why is she asking me? I think it's entirely reasonable to, to, to introduce it with the bill to this parliament. Surely that's what parliament uh, would uh, expect. But I have to say, I, I'm delighted uh, by Ruth Davidson's uh, uh, agreement uh, on the question of process of the referendum. I, I do remember, of course, it was hard that described the SNP government's question as fair and decisive in her reaction just a year ago. Then she subsequently changed her mind uh, after some processes which I won't go into, but she also said that all parties are now accepting the Electoral Commission report. That is excellent news. Will she now communicate that to the Prime Minister uh, and follow the Deputy First Minister's request for serious discussions on the areas of practicality which the Electoral Commission rightly identified? So far we've had a no in terms of Europe 
I know in terms of Trident, at what stage will the Conservative Government start to follow the Electoral Commission recommendations? Thank you. A constituency supplementary from Jenny Mara. First Minister confirmed that two inspectors resigned after Healthcare Improvement Scotland failed to publish a September inspection of Ninewells Hospital. Confirmed that Health Secretary Alex Neil had been alerted to this by Minister Rosanna Cunningham. Asked why this government has not made the original report public when it contains serious reports of 20 elderly people lying on trolleys in corridors. Will the First Minister ask Healthcare Improvement Scotland to now publish the original report because failure to do so only raises suspicion that there has been a cover-up. Why the whitewash, First Minister? First Minister. Well, can I remind Jeremiah uh, that, of course, this process of Healthcare Improvement Scotland inspecting uh, uh, care of older people in acute hospitals was initiated by this government. Before that, there was no process uh, for the Healthcare Improvement Scotland reports. Thus far, there have been 12 hospitals who have been inspected out of the 23 acute hospitals in Scotland that will be uh, inspected by Health Improvement Scotland. It is the case uh, that there are sometimes, and I think, three examples have been follow-up reports. Uh, that's unannounced inspections, which I think is a, a thoroughly good thing to have an unannounced inspection after uh, an announced inspection. Uh, and in two cases, the reports have been published uh, as one. That's the case that she cites and also, I think, the case uh, in Wishaw. And that seems to be also a part of uh, a process of health improvement, healthcare improvement Scotland. But the, the clue to this is in, in the title. The purpose of these reports is to bring about improvement in the standards of care in the health service so as we can avoid the situation which has happened elsewhere where dramatic and very difficult findings have been made in terms of the English health service without a process of inspection. And therefore, Jenny Mara, in fairness, will look at the report where it states on page six, following our unannounced inspection, we feel assured that progress is being made to address the issues we identified in the acute medical assessment unit. Now, that seems to me exactly the purpose of this process of inspection, which was initiated by this government. I think it is important that the whole chamber accepts that that process of inspection from Health Improvement Scotland is exactly the process that is a good thing in the health service, which is prepared to see inspectors go into our hospitals so that when deficiencies are found, improvements can be made. That seems to me very much in the interests of care of our patients in our hospitals. Thank you. Another constituency supplementary from Claire Baker, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the decision by the Board of the Bayer Theatre in St Andrews that the theatre is to go into liquidation and has already closed its doors. Can the First Minister say what discussions the Scottish Government have had with Creative Scotland over this closure and give an assurance that Ministers will do all they can to support discussions between Fife Council and Creative Scotland to, in attempts to secure a future for the Bayer? First Minister. I, I can certainly give that assurance uh, and if the constituency member would like to, to meet the... Uh, uh, to meet the culture secretary. I'm sure that can be uh, arranged on, on this issue. I'm sure across the chamber we hope uh, that a, a good future can be found for the Bayer Theatre and we admire the, the work it's done in the past. So the, the answer to the question is yes and I hope she takes up the offer of a, of a meeting with the culture secretary. Many thanks. Question three, Margaret MacDonald. To ask the First Minister for what purpose the Scottish Government has recently contacted the foreign ministries of EU member states. First Minister. Well, the Deputy First Minister wrote to all 26 uh, European Union foreign ministers to reiterate the Scottish Government's position that we wish Scotland to remain a constructive member of the European Union. That, of course, was uh, partly uh, in response to the messages coming from the Westminster Government uh, that many members of the Conservative Party are looking towards an exit door for the UK as far as the European Union is concerned. Margaret MacDonald. I thank the First Minister for his reply, but can I probe him on this? In her letter, his deputy says that his government considered there to be, quote, a case for reform of certain aspects of the EU, but are supportive of the ongoing process of institutional reform. Does that support of institutional reform mean support for the creation, as the Commission has made quite clear, of a sovereign United States of Europe based on fiscal and political union? 
First Minister. No, it doesn't, uh, and the opposition to that is shared by many states uh, across the European Union. What it points to uh, is our belief that there are within European Union structures a number of policies which could do with fundamental and democratic reform, not least of which is the common fisheries policy, which I was surprised to see the Prime Minister cite as a success in his <laughs> negotiations, as if all the problems were solved. Hardly surprising, of course, because it was a Tory government uh, where the Scottish fishing industry was once described as, quote, expendable yeah. in terms of Britain's wider European interests. Yeah. Exactly why, of course, that this nation of Scotland should represent its own interests within the wider Europe. Thank you very much. Question four, Jim Meady. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to protect the number of nursing and midwifery staff. Minister. Our nurses play a, a vital role in maintaining the health of the nation. Like all National Health Service Scotland staff, they have the security of our no compulsory redundancies guarantee. From September 2006 to December 2012, we've seen an increase of 423 whole-time equivalent qualified nurses from 40, 41,026 uh, to 41,449. It's also worth noting that we have more qualified nurses today working in our National Health Service than in any year under the previous Labour Liberal executive. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Nurses are perhaps the clearest embodiment of the NHS and the public service values for which it stands. But can he provide an assurance that in the application of workforce planning, NHS boards will listen to nurses on the front line, such as those at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children and Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, so that their valuable experience can shape the future of our nursing workforce and deliver the high quality, person-centred care that the people of Scotland quite rightly expect and deserve. First Minister. And the nursing workload planning draw on a huge evidence base in nursing in practice and the tools themselves have been developed in partnership with unions such as the Royal College of Nursing and Midwifery. Boards will work in partnership with nurses so that the planning tools are rolled out successfully uh, across the, the country. And you know, I know that people in the chamber wouldn't want particularly in the Labour benches, to allow their natural anxiety to attack the, the government at every opportunity in any way uh, to be confused with a lack of support for the efforts and quality of our National Health Service staff. Richard Simpson. I think it's breathtaking that the First Minister is accusing this bench of not supporting staff in the NHS when his government has cut almost 2,500 nurses in the last two years. And can I say to him, he often, he often uh, quotes England as being worse than us. England has only cut 7,000 nurses over the same period. So his government has cut more than three times as many nurses proportionately. And at the same time, his government has cut the student intake by 20%, denying 600 aspiring students a career. And that comes on top of the paediatric services in disarray because of lack of staff. Isn't it the case that the SNP's workforce, in reality, is not the guff he's just spoken, but actually a total shambles? First Minister. Of course, as Richard Simpson presumably is aware of his background, we have a higher quotient of nurses in the Scottish National Health Service per head of population, as he's well aware. I just quoted the figures for qualified nursing and midwifery staff, whole-time equivalents. There are more qualified staff in the health service now than there were when we took office. And furthermore, as Richard Simpson should also be aware, there are more people working in the National Health Service in Scotland than when the SNP took office. Now, I think it ill behoves a political party, and Richard Simpson was part of the, the manifesto and the platform, which refused in 2007 to guarantee increased funding for the National Health Service. They would have to cut their cloth, as Lord McConnell said at the time, and then again under the leadership of Ian Gray, refused to confirm the SNP commitment to make sure yes. that in revenue terms, the National Health Service would receive all of the Barnett consequentials. Given the Labour Party wasn't willing to commit during the election campaign to support a National Health Service, then what an audacity to come here yeah. and tell us that you actually support the public National yeah. Health Service in Scotland. Yeah. Question five, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government has approved plans for staff redundancies suggested by the Scottish Police Authority. 
First Minister. Well, the SBA is committed to the Scottish Government's no compulsory redundancy policy. Any reductions to current police support staff are anticipated to be delivered through not replacing people leaving the service, retirements and through voluntary exit schemes. Police officer numbers remain significantly higher than before May 2007. There were 17,454 police officers in Scotland on the 30th of September 2012, an increase of 7.5% or 1,220 officers between March 2007 and September 2012. Bruce MacDonald. Well, let's just assume that that uh, answer to my question was actually a yes, because I think, uh, as far as I can interpret it, that is what he said. Can he therefore confirm, if indeed uh, he, his answer is to imply that he has approved these plans, can he, can he confirm that we're talking about 1,400 police staff to be made redundant or offered early retirement? Can he confirm a cost of £61.3 million for so doing? And can he tell us how those redundancies and retirements are to be funded and at what cost to the police service in the forthcoming financial year? First Minister. No, I, I, I can't uh, uh, confirm these things. What I can confirm is that we have a no compulsory redundancies policy. Yeah. In contrast, not just to the uh, Conservative Liberal Government at Westminster, but in contrast to the Labour Government when they yeah. were in power at Westminster. As Lewis MacDonald is full aware, uh, given that uh, his party supported the move to a, a single national police service in Scotland. That means that there are areas, obviously, of duplication across the, the, the current uh, police boards, uh, which will no longer be required when we move to a single national police service. That was one of the arguments and points of having a single police service in Scotland. But, of course, the other significant point, apart from the, the no compulsory redundancy policy, which I think is of huge assurance uh, to staff across Scotland, not just in the police service, but the National Health Service across the public. Well, I see Labour members actually shaking their heads. Do they think that no compulsory redundancy policy is a good thing? in the public services of Scotland? Don't you think it would have been good if the Labour Party had introduced such a policy when they were in government? Are they seriously questioning that commitment which the SNP government have introduced? And the key thing, which of course Lewis MacDonald didn't point to, is that the policing policies of this government implemented by our police support staff and our police officers have now resulted in recorded crime in Scotland being at a 37-year low. Brief supplementary, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. What does the First Minister think of the proposal by the Westminster Government, incidentally shared by Labour opposition there, that senior police officers need not have any policing experience? <laughs> First Minister. I know that the consultation and direct entry to police in England and Wales comes from a recommendation in the Windsor Review. The Scottish Government did not commission the Windsor Review, which relates to policing in England and Wales. We will not be implementing the Windsor package in Scotland. In contrast, police confidence, uh, public confidence in the police is at a historic high in Scotland. Police confidence in the Westminster Government is at a historic low south of the border. And I think it's my firm recollection that the Labour Party in Westminster are not actually complaining about the number of uh, police or the principle are not complaining about the principle of police redundancy south of the border, but actually just complaining about the number. In contrast to the expanding situation of frontline officers in Scotland delivering the 37-year low in recorded crime. Annabel Goldie. Given the First Minister's response to Lewis MacDonald about civilian staff, and given the escalating numbers of police officers being placed in restricted duties, how is there going to be room for all these people in the back offices of our police stations the length and breadth of Scotland? First Minister. I think the uh, government's commitment to the police service uh, in Scotland over these uh, last uh, six years is uh, basically beyond argument, given both the success in implementing the numbers of police officers in the streets and communities in Scotland and the result in terms of the fall in recorded crime. It does seem to me recorded crime at a 37 year low and police numbers in Scotland at a record high are two things which are not just related but both indicate the success of the criminal justice policy of this government. Thank you. Question six, Gavin Brown. Officer, to ask the First Minister what projects and at what value have been delivered 
through the non-profit distributing model pipeline in 2012-13. First Minister. Well, the 2.5 billion NPD project pipeline is one of the largest programmes of its kind in Europe. Uh, and I know that Gavin Brown will be delighted to know that the value of the NPD projects which have entered procurement through the hub programme and other means in 2012-13 to date is approximately £900 million. Pounds. Gavin Brown. Presiding officer, the First Minister said earlier he likes to spend time in cyberspace. <laughs> and I think, I, think, I think it's where he got that answer. My, my, my question was specifically on what has been delivered in 2012 and 13. Can he now answer that question? As uh, Gavin Brown uh, well knows, the NPD programme is a project-based uh, finance programme. The, I, well, the, it's issue of entering, the issue of entering procurement Order. is rather important because that are the projects which are now being bid for by construction companies uh, across Scotland. Well, he wants some detail. Let's give him some detail. <laughs> Brecon School, Wick School, James Gillespie School, the National Health Service Lanarkshire, Woodside Health Centre, Eastwood Health Centre, Gorbals Health Centre, Maryhill Health Centre, Royal Edinburgh Hospital, in the area meant to be represented by Gavin Brown. Order! Head Mental Health, Forest Tain Woodside, a £14 million project, Kilmarnock College, a £15 million project, entered into the journal on the 4th of April 2012. The National Health Service Lothian Royal Hospital for Sick Children, 155 million pound project entered into the journal in the 5th of December 2012. The Scottish National Transfusion Order. Service, a 36 million pound project in the 10th of December 2012. Ayrshire and Arden Acute Mental Health, the 14th of January 2013. And most recently, and of great pleasure, to the members Enough. of this chamber of oh, no. Scotland. The AWPR Balmedi to Tipperty, 472 million entered into the journal on the 18th of January this year. Right. Order. Right. If we can have a bit of calm, please. Ken McIntosh, a brief supplementary. <laughs> so, presenting officer, I had a serious question about, about about digging holes, but the private, the first minister seems to be the only person digging a hole around here. Can I? Can I just ask the First Minister, he has confirmed, or at least his government has confirmed, that there has been slippage in the programme of at least 300 million this year and at least 300 million yet, uh, next year under the general terms education and health. Can he promise to specifically tell us which projects, because I understand they include half the list he's read out here, including Wick High School and James Gillespie's. Minister. The information, uh, of course, was presented to the Parliamentary Committee, but I I'm glad that that supplement has been asked because the Labour Party seemed to be suggesting that in terms of project-based finance, uh, you can shift the project-based finance dedicated to some projects and put it over to other projects. That is not how project and revenue-based finance works. It has to be based on these projects. You know, a two-point, and let's remember why. We're introducing the 2.5 billion NPD programme. One of the reasons, of course, is the dramatic cutbacks in direct capital spending. Capital spending has the advantage, direct capital spending, that you can implement it very quickly, as John Swinney has demonstrated in the Shovel Ready projects over the last few months. Well, he has announced substantial amounts of Shovel Ready projects Order. in the Order. last few weeks. Has the Labour Party been sleeping? Why has that been necessary? Because Alistair Darling, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, yes. postulated a cut of 36% in the capital investment direct budget for Scotland. The Conservative Party and to budget I think, have reduced that cut to 26%, which they claim is an, an increase. I think the NPD programme, NPD programme is going to deliver, as illustrated, by the commitments under procurement substantial benefits for the people of Scotland. 
And I think the Labour Party should hang their heads in shame yeah. that Alastair Darling yeah. created the situation that we're going forward with. And that concludes questions to the First Minister. Thank you.